Hello everyone, I'm Kathleen Pelly. Welcome to the special omnibus edition of Journey with Story, where you can listen to all of this month's episodes one after the other. And just so you know, there will be no special intro for the individual stories, no added details and no shout outs. If you want to hear all of those, then you'll need to listen to the individual episodes and not this version. Got it? Oh, mums, dads, grown-ups, you can download some free colouring sheets at our website, www.journeywithstory.com. Let's take an omnibus journey with story. Now, let's take an encore journey with Whoopity Story. Oh, there might be a few Scottish words here that you're not familiar with, but you should be able to guess the meaning pretty easily, I think. Long, long ago, in a cottage high on a hill, lived a poor widow who was called the old wife of Kittle Rumpet and her daughter, Kirsty. They lived a simple life with just enough wood to put fire on the hearth and just enough milk and bread to have a meagre supper of an evening. But they did own a handsome pig by the name of Truffles, who was ready to have picklets any day now. But one morning, when Kirsty went out to fill Truffles' trough, she found the poor beast on its back, groaning and moaning with its trotters up in the air. Mum! Mum! cried Kirsty. Come quick! Poor Truffles is in a bad way! The old wife and Kirsty knelt down and tried to make the poor beast more comfortable, offering her tiny sips of water and stroking her behind her ears just the way she liked. But it was no use. Truffles grew weaker and weaker with every passing minute. Her breaths became slow and laboured, and poor Kirsty and her mum feared for the worst. Together they sat on the knocking stone outside the cottage and wept for their poor truffles, but also for themselves, for those piglets would have given them some much-needed extra money to put more food on the table and wood on the fire. Suddenly they noticed someone coming down the road. A strange looking body with the shape of a woman with the walk of a laddie. As she got closer, the old wife noticed her clothes. She was wearing a green velvet dress with a bonny crisp white apron and on her head a big tall bonnet made of beaver. She was holding a big staff too which really was odd. To the old wife of Kittle Rumpet's surprise, this strange woman walked right up to her and said, Now don't you bother telling me what's wrong because I ken all about it. I ken all about you being a widow and I ken all about how your pig's not well. So what if I told you that I could fix that pig? (gasps) Could you really fix my pig? said the old wife. Oh, if you could, that would be just wonderful because at the moment... I feel it the most unfortunate soul on earth. Very well, I can make your pig better. But what will you give me in return? Said the strange woman. I'll give you anything at all, said the wife, bowing low to the ground in a deep curtsy and ready to kiss the hem of her gown. No, 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 screeched the woman. None of your kissing and curtsying. Let's just wet thumbs in the bargain. And so Kirsty's mother and this green lady licked thumbs and pressed them together. Then the green lady demanded, Now let me see your pig. She stepped into the pigsty, looked in her bag and took out a wee bottle which contained a black liquid and shook three drops into the pig's ears and snout. 
No sooner had she finished than the pig jumped up onto its wee trotter straight away and trotted off to the trough where she began to gobble up her food as if nothing at all had ever been amiss. Oh, thank you ever so much, said the old wife of Kittle Rumpet. Now what can I give you in return for curing our darling truffles? Food? Drink? Clothes? Ah, oh, no thank you, said the woman. You will not find me greedy, all I ask. All I demand is your wee lassie. My lassie? cried the old wife. Oh, you cannot take her. But you said I could have anything I liked. Oh, but not my wee bairnie, wailed the old wife. And she began to weep and wail, wringing her hands in despair. For now she knew she had struck a bargain with a fairy. A deal is a deal, a promise is a promise, said the green fairy. You promised me anything, so I shall take your wee bairn. The old wife of Kittle Rumpet could barely believe her ears. What kind of a person takes a bairn away from his mother? How could she save her wee lassie? And she started to wail and weep and howl with grief and sorrow. Your wailing won't help you, said the green fairy, but I can tell you by fairy law I cannot take your daughter until three days from now, and even then I cannot take her if you manage to guess my name correctly in three tries, but you will never guess it. With that, off she whirled with her big staff and disappeared down the hill. The old wife of Kittle Rumpet didn't know what to do. She sat down and tried to think, but all she could do was weep. And so she wept and wept for two days and two nights until her tears ran dry. And then, on the third morning, she had an idea. She rifled through cupboards and drawers until she found a big book of names that she began to read page after page. Oh, maybe Elsa is the green fairy's name, she wondered. Or Vary, or Poppy, or Prunella. She kept turning page after page, and so absorbed was she in her task that she never noticed truffles stealing out of her sty and running down the hill. But Kirsty did. Truffles, she cried. Come back, come back. But Truffles paid no heed. Through the forest she ran, across a stream she swam, and finally into an old quarry hole she clambered, with Kirsty close on her trail. Then Kirsty heard the whirring of a wheel, and there before her was a strange green woman with a staff. It was the cunning fairy who had visited them, for sure. She was sitting there, spinning on a huge spinning wheel, and as she spun, she chanted, Little does our old wifey of Kittle Rumpet ken that whoopity story is my name. Little does our old wifey of Kittle Rumpet ken that whoopity story is my name. Kirsty pressed her finger to her lips as she stroked Truffles' snout, whispering, Come on now, Truffles, let's go tell Mum the green fairy's name. Kirsty and Truffles carefully made their way out of the quarry, over the stream and into the forest, but suddenly a huge green dust cloud swirled by them. It was the green fairy who whirled by them all the way to the top of the hill, where the old wife was still sitting on the knocking stone, reading her book of names. Good woman of Kittle Rumpet, she cried. It is time to hand over your beard to me. A bargain is a bargain. Oh, could I not have a guess at your name first, said the wife. I suppose so, but you'll never guess it, said the fairy. Is it Willowisp Woman? asked the old wife. <laughs> no, it's not, laughed the fairy. You'll never guess it. Is it Tittle Tattle Tot 
all. Not even close, said the fairy. And that's two tries you'd use, only one left. Just as the poor wife opened her mouth to give another wild guess, Kirsty came bounding up the hill. Mum! Mum! She panted. Don't you know? This green lady is none other than Whoopity Sturdy! The fairy turned as white as a sheet, leapt into the air and screeched with fury as off she whirled down the hill in a green plume of rage. <laughs> Kirsty and her mum did a jig of joy. But where is Truffles? asked the old wife, looking around. She must still be trying to follow me home, said Kirsty, and off they went in search of her. They found her at the very bottom of the hill, but she was not alone. There were three baby pigs squealing at her side. Kirsty and her mum did another jig of joy, and then they sat down to decide what name to give Truffles three wee babies. And when they decided on Snouter, Squealer and Stubble, off they went to tell their neighbours the story of Whoopity Story, just as I have told you here. Now, let's take a journey with The Shepherd and the Fairies. Long, long ago in Ireland, a young shepherd called Eamon was herding his flock toward home when a heavy mist came down and cloaked the hills so he could no longer see his way. Eamon walked and walked, but alas, he knew he was walking in circles. After some time he came to a hollow place surrounded by rushes, and in the midst of those rushes he saw rings. At once he understood this was one of those places the villagers spoke of, the home of the fair folk. "'Tis one of the dancing places,' he said aloud, and a shiver of fear passed through him. "'I must be away,' and he turned to leave." Alas, he could not move. It was as if he was frozen to the spot, and no matter how hard he tried, he could not budge. After a little while, a jolly old man appeared, and Eamon hoped that perhaps this man could help him find his way home. Excuse me, he began. But before he could utter one more word, the old man put a chubby finger to his lips and shushed the lad. Do not say another word until I tell you to, he said. Now follow me. Eamon had little choice but to do as the man said, and once the old man began to walk, Eamon too could walk. He followed him for a while until they reached a standing stone, long and narrow a stone the people called a menhur. Follow me, don't be afraid, the old man said, and he tapped three times upon the stone. Then the great stone glided smoothly backward and revealed a dark, narrow path with steps leading downward. Eamon felt a quiver of fear and wondered what would become of him now. He rubbed his eyes, and when he opened them again, he saw a blue light shining from the stairwell. The old man walked into the light and turned to Eamon. Follow me! Eamon had no choice, and so he fell into line behind the old man. They walked for a while, and then they came to a forest, thick and fragrant. 
In the distance, Eamon saw tall mountains rising, and as they walked, they followed the path of a beautiful clear river. Everywhere Eamon looked, he saw a sight more beautiful than the last. Towering trees bursting with bright blossoms, and all around him, sweet-scented flowers of all the colours of a rainbow. Suddenly, he heard the sound of birds, and of heavenly music, violins, and flutes, and harps. Finally, they came to a palace that Eamon guessed must be the home of the old man. He followed him inside into a high-ceilinged room with a long wooden table. Sit and we shall feast, the old man said. Soon platters of fruit and cheese and sweets began to appear. But they floated through the air, carried by no one. Then Eamon heard voices all around him. Strange, whispery voices they were. But every time he turned to see who was speaking, he saw no one at all. Welcome, the old man said. Now you may speak. Eamon opened his mouth to ask them many questions he wished to ask. But no matter how hard he tried, he could not speak. He felt as though he had lost his tongue. And then there before him appeared an old lady, followed by three beautiful young ladies. As soon as they caught sight of Eamon, they smiled and called out to him. But no matter how hard he tried, still Eamon could not utter a sound. One of the girls, Neve, rushed forward and kissed him on the lips, and at once Eamon's voice returned. Everyone began to speak and laugh and joke and tell stories. Eamon felt his heart swell with joy and such happiness as he had never felt before. Together they feasted and danced and made merry, and before they knew it, A whole year and one day had passed, as if in a single afternoon. Eamon loved this world and being with his beloved Neve, but he missed his family and his old friends. So one day he said to the old man, I must go home. Ah, wait a while, the old man said. And so Eamon waited. Another year passed. But then Eamon woke one day, and he knew he must see his old friends. I love you, dear Neve, he said, but I must go home. Oh no, do not leave me, she begged. Do not worry, Eamon told her. I promise I will return to you. And so Neve showered him with riches, dressing him in the finest silks, and loading his pockets with silver and gold. Take these with you, but make certain to come back here to me. Eamon bade her farewell, then he climbed the stairs, lifted the stone, and at once he set off for home, now certain of the way back again. But when he reached his village, no one knew him. They spoke the name of the boy they had known as Eamon. He died long ago, they said. They refused to believe Eamon's claim that he was the boy they once knew, for they did not recognise him in his fine clothing and regal airs. How could he possibly be a simple shepherd lad? And so it came to pass that on the first day of the new moon, Eamon took his leave from his old home and went back to see his beloved Neve, who was waiting for him. They were married that very day, and then Eamon asked her to come and live with him in his world. All of the fairy folk gathered around to bid the young couple farewell, and they gave the gift of two ponies, as white as the morning frost. 
When Eamon and Neve reached the upper world, they began their new life there and lived happily ever after. Neve was known as the fairest lady in all the land. And so it is to this day that those who come from the land of enchantment are called the fair family. Now, let's take a journey with the Pot of Gold. One fine spring morning, when Liam O'Toole was walking down the lane, he heard a strange hammering sound. Now, wherever is that coming from? he wondered, and he peered over the fence into a cabbage field, and what did he see? But a wee man in a pointy hat and a leather apron, sitting cross-legged, mending a shoe. Liam could hardly believe his luck, because he knew as well as everyone else around that if you find a leprechaun, he must tell you where his pot of gold is hidden. Ah, now is my chance at last to be rich, Liam said to himself. I just need to keep calm and never let him out of my sight, so he won't escape from me. Gently, Liam pushed open the gate. At once, the leprechaun stopped his hammering. I think it's going to rain, he said. Will you be hurrying off to take the shortcut through the other field so you don't get wet and catch a chill? Ah, oh, no, no need for that. Sure, there's not a cloud in the sky. I don't think it'll be raining today, answered Liam, knowing full well the leprechaun was trying to trick him. Well, in that case, continued the leprechaun, I'd thank you to be sure and shut the gate so I don't get a draught. But again Liam was wise to the leprechaun's craftiness and had no intention of turning around. Ah, now that I have found you, you have to tell me where your pot of gold is, he said. Ah, now, now, don't be so hasty, replied the leprechaun with a frown. I will take you to my pot of gold soon enough, but you can't walk far in those old worn-out boots of yours. Why don't I make you a new pair before we set off? Liam reached down and shook the leprechaun. I don't need any new boots, he snapped. Ah, oh, stop your shaking, squealed the leprechaun as he kicked and wriggled and walloped Liam with his tiny hammer. Leave me alone or I'll have no breath for telling you where it is. Then promise me now that you will show me at once and no more of your shenanigans, said Liam. And the little old man agreed. Then up he stood, straightened his hat and set off across the cabbage field at such a pace that Liam had to hurry to keep up with him. When they reached the middle of the field, the leprechaun stopped and pointed at a cabbage. Here it is, he said. All of my life's treasure, all my precious gold is buried under here. You just need to dig it up. Liam could barely conceal his excitement at the thought of laying his hands on all of this gold. Now the only thing is, muttered the leprechaun, you'll be needing a spade, won't you? At once Liam's excitement fizzled away, for he knew the leprechaun was quite right. Without a spade, he could never dig up his treasure. But... If he went home to fetch one, then he'd never be able to find this cabbage again. Oh! Suddenly, Liam had an idea. He untied the red handkerchief from his neck and wrapped it around the cabbage. Now promise me you won't touch this handkerchief while I go home to fetch a spade, he said sternly. Me touch your handkerchief? Ah, of course not. I'll not lay a finger on it. You can be sure of that 
said the leprechaun as he lit up his pipe. You can trust me. So Liam hurried off home to fetch a spade. On the way back up the lane, he thought of all the wonderful things he could buy with his pot of gold. He laughed to himself at the thought of never having to do another day's work in his life. But when he reached the field, he stopped at the gate and stared and stared, hardly believing his eyes, for every single cabbage as far as you could see, was tied with a red handkerchief. Liam's heart sank. The crafty leprechaun was nowhere now to be seen, but from far, far, far away came the sound of a distant chuckle and a little Now, let's take a journey with the White Hare and the Crocodiles. Long, long ago, when all the animals could talk, there lived in the province of Inaba in Japan, a little white hare. His home was on the island of Oki, and just across the sea, was the mainland of Inaba. Now, the hare wanted very much to cross over to Inaba. Day after day, he would go out and sit on the shore and look longingly over the water in the direction of Inaba. And day after day, he hoped to find some way of getting across. One day, as usual, the hare was standing on the beach, looking towards the mainland across the water, when he saw a great crocodile swimming near the island. This is very lucky, thought the hare. Now I shall be able to get my wish. I will ask the crocodile to carry me across the sea. But he was doubtful whether the crocodile would consent to do what he wanted, so he thought instead of asking a favour, he would try to get what he wanted by a trick. So with a loud voice, he called to the crocodile and said, Oh, Mr. Crocodile, isn't it a lovely day? The crocodile, who had come out all by itself that day to enjoy the bright sunshine, was just beginning to feel a bit lonely when the hare's cheerful greeting broke the silence. The crocodile swam nearer the shore, very pleased to hear someone speak. I wonder who it was that spoke to me just now. Was it you, Mr. Hare? You must be very lonely all by yourself. Oh, no, I'm not at all lonely, said the hare. But as it was such a fine day, I came out here to enjoy myself. Won't you stop and play with me a little while? The crocodile came out of the sea and sat on the shore, and the two played together for some time. Then the hare said, Mr. Crocodile, you live in the sea and I live on this island. And we do not often meet, so I know very little about you. Tell me. Do you think the number of your company is greater than mine? Of course there are more crocodiles than hares, answered the crocodile. Can you not see that for yourself? You live on this small island while I live in the sea, which spreads through all parts of the world. So if I call together all the crocodiles who dwell in the sea, you hares will be as nothing compared to us. 
The crocodile was very conceited. The hare, who meant to play a trick on the crocodile, said, Do you think it possible for you to call up enough crocodiles to form a line from this island across the sea to Inaba? The crocodile thought for a moment and then answered, Of course it is possible. Then do try, said the artful hare, and I will count the number from here. The crocodile, who was very simple-minded and who hadn't the least idea that the hare intended to play a trick on him, agreed to do what the hare asked and said, Wait a little while, I go back into the sea and then I'll call my company together. The crocodile plunged into the sea and was gone for some time. The hare, meanwhile, waited patiently on the shore. At last the crocodile appeared bringing with him a large number of other crocodiles. Look, Mr. Hare, said the crocodile, it is nothing for my friends to form a line between here and Inaba. There are enough crocodiles to stretch from here, even as far as China or India. Did you ever see so many crocodiles? Then the whole company of crocodiles arranged themselves in the water so as to form a bridge between the island of Oki and the mainland of Inaba. When the hare saw the bridge of crocodiles, he said, How oh, splendid! I did not believe this was possible. Now, let me count you all. To do this, however, with your permission, I must walk over on your backs to the other side. So, please be so good as not to move, or else I shall fall into the sea and be drowned. So the hare hopped off the island onto the strange bridge of crocodiles, counting as he jumped from one crocodile's back to the other. Please keep quite still or I shall not be able to count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And thus the cunning hare walked right across to the mainland of Inaba. Not content with getting his wish, he began to jeer at the crocodiles instead of thanking them, and said as he leapt off the last one's back, Oh, you stupid crocodiles! Now I have done with you! And he was just about to run away as fast as he could, but he did not escape so easily. For as soon as the crocodiles understood that this was a trick played upon them by the hare, so that he could cross the sea, and now the hare was laughing at them for their stupidity. They fumed with red-hot anger and made up their minds to take revenge. So some of them ran after the hare and caught him. Then they all surrounded the poor little animal and pulled out all his fur. He cried out loudly and entreated them to spare him. But with each tuft of fur they pulled out, they said, Serve you! Right! And when the crocodiles had pulled out the last bit of fur, they threw the poor hare on the beach, and they all swam away, laughing at what they had done. The hare was now in a pitiful plight. All his beautiful white fur had been pulled out, and his bare little body was all a quiver and a tremble. He could barely move, and all he could do was to lie on the beach quite helpless and weep over the misfortune that had befallen him. And even although it was his own fault, anyone seeing the poor little creature could not help feeling sorry for him in his sad state. Just at this time, a number of men, who looked like king's sons, happened to pass by, and seeing the hare lying on the beach crying, they stopped and asked what was the matter. The hare lifted up his head from between his paws and answered them, saying, I had a fight with some crocodiles, but I was beaten, and they pulled out all my fur and left me to suffer here, and that's why I'm crying. Now, one of these young men had a bad and spiteful disposition, but he feigned kindness, and he said to the hare, I feel very sorry for you. If you will only try it, I know of a remedy which will cure your sore body. 
go and bathe yourself on the sea and then come and sit in the wind. This will make your fur grow again and you will be just as you were before. Then all the young men passed on. The hare was very pleased, thinking that he had found a cure, and he went and bathed in the sea, and then he came out, and he sat where the wind could blow upon him. But as the wind blew and dried him, his skin became drawn and hardened, and the salt increased the pain so much that he rolled on the sand and cried aloud. Just then another king's son passed by, carrying a great bag on his back. He saw the hare and stopped and asked why he was crying. But the poor hare, remembering that he had been deceived by one very like the man who now spoke to him, did not answer, but continued to cry. But this man had a kind heart, and he looked at the hare very pityingly, and he said, Ah, you poor thing, I see that your fur is all pulled out, and that your skin is quite bare. Who can have treated you so cruelly? When the hare heard these kind words, he felt very grateful to the man, and encouraged by his gentle manner, the hare told him all that had befallen him. When the hare had finished his story, the man was full of pity, and he said, I am very sorry for all you have suffered. But remember, it was only the consequence of the deceit you practised on the crocodiles. I know, answered the sorrowful hare, but I have repented and I've made up my mind never to use deceit again. So I beg you to show me how I may cure my sore body and make the fur grow again. Then I will tell you of a good remedy, said the man. First... Go and bathe well in that pond over there and try to wash all the salt from your body. Then pick some of those kaba flowers that are growing near the edge of the water. Spread them on the ground and roll yourself on them. If you do this, the pollen will cause your fur to grow again and you will be quite well in a little while. The hare was very glad to be told what to do so kindly. He crawled to the pond, pointed out to him, and he bathed well in it, and then picked the kappa flowers growing near the water, and rolled himself on them. To his amazement, even while he was doing this, he saw his nice white fur growing again. The pain ceased, and he felt just as he had done before all his misfortunes. The hare was overjoyed at his quick recovery, and he went hopping joyfully towards the young man who had so helped him, and kneeling down to his feet, he said, I cannot express my thanks for all you have done for me. It is my earnest wish to do something for you in return. Please tell me who you are. <laughs> I am no king's son, as you think me. I am a fairy, and my name is Okuni Noshi no Mikoto, answered the man. And those beings who passed here before me are my brothers. They have heard of a beautiful princess called Yakami, who lives in this province of Inaba, and they are on their way to find her and to ask her to marry one of them. But on this expedition I am only an attendant, so I am walking behind them with this great big bag on my back. The hare humbled himself before this great fairy Okuni Nushi no Mikoto who many in that part of the land worshipped as a god. Oh, I did not know that you were Okuni Nushi no Mikoto. How kind you have been to me. It is impossible to believe that that unkind fellow who sent me to bathe in the sea is one of your brothers. I am quite sure that the princess, whom your brothers have gone to seek, will refuse to be the bride of any of them and will prefer you for your goodness of heart. I am quite sure that you will win her heart without intending to do so, and she will ask to be your bride. Okuni Nushi no Mikoto took no notice of what the hare said, but bidding the little animal goodbye, went on his way, quickly, 
and soon overtook his brothers. He found them just entering the princess's gate, and just as the hare had said, the princess could not be persuaded to become the bride of any of the brothers. But when she looked at the kind brother's face, she went straight up to him and said, To you I give myself. And so they were married. This is the end of the story. Okuni Nushi no Mikoto is worshipped by the people in some parts of Japan as a god, and the hare has become famous as the white hare of Inaba. But what became of the crocodiles? Nobody knows. Now, let's take a journey with a rabbit and crab. Once upon a time, two good friends, rabbit and crab, decided to grow some carrots. For many days, they worked together. They dug up a field they chose the carrot seeds with great care. They planted them in the soil and watered them every day until the shoots began to sprout up. Then, every week, they made sure to dig up the weeds and keep watch until at last, one day, it was time to harvest the crop and separate the tops from the carrots. And this is when things began to go awry. That just means very badly. Because they could not agree on how best to divide the crop between the two of them. Rabbit tried to trick Crab with some sweet talk. You see, friend Crab, that we have two piles consisting of different sizes. The larger one is for you. And I'll take the small one. Crab looked at the two piles and saw at once that the biggest pile was all carrot tops and the smaller pile had all the big juicy carrots. Oh, thank you, rabbit, good friend, he said. But I have a better plan. Why don't I divide the piles in half and you choose which you want? Or you divide the piles and I choose? Rabbit suspected that Crab was trying to confuse him. Oh no, I cannot agree to that, he said. I have a better idea. Let's walk over to that big cactus over there and then race back here. The first one to get back here gets the carrots and the other gets the tops. What do you think of that? Crab thought about it for a moment. Then, smiling, he said, Yes, I will agree to that. It seems fair to me. At last we're in agreement, said Rabbit. He was very happy because he was sure he was going to win. I'm so pleased about this that if you win, I'm prepared to give you all the carrots and all the tops. Do you agree? I agree, repeated the crab. There's one other thing, added Rabbit. Since I know you are slower than me, I'm going to give you a ten-pace head start. 
He had no doubt that he would win this race and soon be munching away on a big pile of juicy carrots. Mr. Rabbit, my friend, thank you very much. But that's too much. I cannot accept that, said Crab, pretending that he didn't want to take advantage of Rabbit. You're the one that ought to have a ten pace start. Go on now. I won't take no for an answer. Rabbit chuckled to himself. <laughs> I gave him a chance, he thought, and he argued no more about it. So when they reached the big cactus, Rabbit and Crab turned to face the piles of carrots and green tops in the distance. Then Rabbit took ten pieces forward. But he did not notice that Crab, who was neither lazy or slow, had grabbed his tail with his claws and was hanging on tight. Ready, steady, go, shouted Rabbit as he bounded off, running like the wind. In no time at all, he reached the pile of carrots and turned around quickly, thinking that he had left Crab far behind in the dust. But just as he turned his head, Crab opened his claws and fell right on top of the mound of carrots. Where are you, Mr. Crab, my friend? Rabbit shouted, pretending to be most concerned. Oh, here I am, said a voice behind him. I've been here for ages. Rabbit could not believe his eyes. He spun around and stared and stared at Crab, sitting on the huge pile of carrots. But, but, how, how, what? stammered Rabbit. There, there, dear friend Rabbit, soothed Crab. I won't see you go hungry. I can be generous too. You can have as many of those carrot tops as you wish. Help yourself. Rabbit turned around and stomped off home, furious that he had let himself be tricked. And no matter how hard he tried, he still could not figure out how a slow coach of a crab was able to beat him. And that is how Crab got to keep all of the carrots for himself. I hope you enjoyed all of our stories for this month. And if you subscribe to our Patreon page, you can enjoy even more perks and resources. Here's to stories aplenty that fill our hearts with grace and goodness, hope and light, so that we remember, as my favourite poet says, All shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Be well, my friends, be well, and join me next time for Journey with Story. Music and post-production was by Colette Jonas.